The Bob Murphy Show, episode 222. What you gonna do? Get ready for another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. It's your source for commentary and interviews conducted by a Christian and economist. Now here's your host, Bob Murphy. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. Today I'm gonna be talking with Chris Borer, who is the author of the book, The Ethics of Anarcho-Capitalism. And in the interest of full disclosure, I should say that Chris was highly recommended to me by somebody who helps produce this show. And so that's what put him on my radar. But I did agree to <laughs> do it because it looked like a very interesting book, as you'll see in the interview. But I do like to disclose that if any time there's an external influence, unless it's Putin, in which case I keep that to myself. So let me just give you a little bit of background. Chris Borer is an entrepreneur with a background in robotics and artificial intelligence. His book, the one we're discussing in this interview, is narrative nonfiction that illustrates why libertarianism cannot be defined precisely with physical concepts like force or property boundaries. Instead, libertarians should use praxeology to define conflict, aggression, and the NAP. So I think all of that will be spelled out in more detail as the interview unfolds. So without further ado, here's my discussion with Chris Borer. Well, Chris, welcome to the Bob Murphy Show. Great to be with you. So folks, as I said in the introduction, uh, for those on watching the YouTube thing, I'm holding up the, uh, the book. We're going to be largely talking about Chris's book titled The Ethics of Anarcho-Capitalism. But before we dive into that, let's just spend a minute. Chris, can you tell us a bit about your background and how did you stumble upon these unusual views? <laughs> sure. Uh, I guess I grew up in New Jersey, went to school in PA, lived in New York for a bit, but now I'm based in Miami. Uh, my background's in engineering, <clears throat> so robotics, artificial intelligence, um, but I guess it's more accurate to say I'm more of an entrepreneur. Uh, I built a company that makes robotic key copying kiosks, another company that makes uh, self-service creation of legal documents. Um, so that's kind of me in a nutshell. How did I get into anarcho-capitalism? Uh, I had some friends in college who were into libertarianism, mm -hmm. um, but I think we've I all had two or three of those. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think I got really into it during the Ron Paul 2008 presidential campaign. Okay. Uh, met a bunch of people in Philly who were super into it, and uh, I don't know about you, but I had a ton of fun. That was such a, a fun time. And, uh, you know, we were all reading and watching everything we could about libertarianism. So can, I, can I stop you? So you, you were going to school in Philadelphia? Because right, yeah, you said PA originally, but now you're being more specific. It was in Philadelphia? I was in Philly at the time. Okay. I remember I just saw some someone scrawled Ron Paul 2008 on a sidewalk somewhere in Chalk. Mm -hmm. Went to one of the rallies and it was kind of the, the beginning of the end. Um, well, this is interesting. So that person who did that actually changed your life and this book perhaps would not have existed if that person didn't bother taking the chalk and writing it on the sidewalk. I definitely agree with that. Yeah. So, so many little things like that really helped me get here, but not just that, but people who put out books and podcasts at the time helped me, uh, you know, go step by step from, you know, originally I was a Republican by association coming from rural New Jersey and then, then libertarian in college and then all the way to ANCAP because of all the people who put in little bits of effort over time to get me there. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, now, is, now, hang on. Do you, by that, do you mean people in your personal life who are like, hey, now check this out or like would ask you, well, gee, if, you know, how does Minarchy become a stable system? Or do you mean the people who wrote essays and things? And that's what, when you said people who put in a little bit of effort, that what, what effort are you talking about? You kind of get hit from so many different angles when you're uh -huh. trying to figure things out in life. So friends handing you a pamphlet that someone wrote, the person who wrote the pamphlet, people who did podcasts. Yeah, you know, there are people who do like, academic thinking and try to come up with conceptual level stuff. But then there are also people who popularize and that's important too. Mm -hmm. So even people who are just creating memes online about libertarianism and anarcho-capitalism, I think that helps a lot as well. Okay, great. So I, I am curious about this. So let me just ask you, before, again, we're going to jump in your book, obviously in a minute here, but do you remember specifically, um, like for me, I know I was 
a fan of Austrian economics in high school, but I was still, I don't know if I knew what the term meant, but I would have been a minarchist. You know, like I, I love Thomas Paine and rights of man and stuff. And I thought, oh, the government's constituted to you yeah. know, defend um, rights and, and stuff like that. And that, that's, that's the purpose of government. Uh, and then I remember when I read Rothbard's For a New Liberty in high school, I thought he was a good economist and everything, but I was, I was surprised. Whoa, this guy's really out there. He doesn't believe in any government. <laughs> and then, um, and then I think it was a freshman, my freshman year in college when I finally went over the edge. Um, and it was more just like relaxing, like just realizing that, no, it's not that if the state withered away, then we would be overrun by mass murderers and armies and stuff like that. You know, like it was more just, I had this lingering fear and that's why I thought I needed the state. And it was more of a relaxation. It wasn't that it wasn't some intellectual epiphany. In other words, it was, I already had all the, the arguments and then it was just for some reason relaxing and really, and just saying, no, I can, you can trust freedom. It won't blow up in your face. Do you remember like, you know, was there some particular thing that was a, a hold up for you? Uh, l- one more thing. And then I'll study. I know this is a long question. Because <laughs> I remember things that were holding me back where I had just assumed what I learned in school that, oh, we had laissez-faire capitalism in the 1920s and it gave us the Great Depression. And so if you have that filed away as a fact, even though ethically that shouldn't matter, that still is a hard hurdle. And then so, like, you know, me reading Milton Friedman and thinking, oh, the Fed, now I actually disagree with his analysis, but still to blame it on the Fed, fine. <laughs> and, and so that, that showed you if you didn't have government – then you'd be all right. And then also it was the, yeah, the, like the military stuff. And I think it was probably Ralph Rakel that helped me with that stuff about, you know, well, gee, we're just sitting there minding our own business. And then, you know, Hitler tries to take over the world. What are we supposed to do? But anyway, that was my long uh, preface to asking you, would you, do you remember were there specific things that were holding you back or was it just a gradual? Yeah. I've met some people who were lucky enough to grow up libertarian, but that wasn't me. So I had to go through this very painful transition period. Um, where you know you you're told your whole life government is necessary, and you know you get this idea when you start reading about economics that you know, less is better, less is better. But how far can you go? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there was a secret ANCAP in our Ron Paul group in Philadelphia who was kind of just slipping people information. And uh, what started doing it for me was the Anatomy of the State. Uh, her name was Serenity. She gave me Anatomy of the State. I read it. I'm like, this kind of makes sense, but I'm too uncomfortable to accept it right now. Mm-hmm. But, then I started reading more Rothbard stuff, and Ron Paul obviously mentioned Rothbard a few times. So after reading a couple of his books, then it was just like you said—you just kind of give up. And you're like, "Yeah, this this has to be right." And then I was off to the races. Um, and then I think it was solidified around the time I went to Mises University. Uh, you were actually there as a faculty. I don't know if you remember. I was the kid who asked you to sign his guitar. But uh, you know, being around 250 other libertarian uh, college kids who are discussing ideas. And I think, you know, the big discussions late at night were always minarchy versus anarchism. That really solidified it for me. Mm-hmm. See, I just want to tell people the, the strategy I just went through in my head there because I'm tempted to say, oh yeah, I totally remember you. But then I was like, but what if you're tricking me and you never did offer it? But then I could say, no, there was some other kid who gave me his guitar. So you can't prove that I was lying when I said I remember that. See how that works? Yeah. So that's, <laughs> I do vaguely remember, but it's, it's not jumping out at me. So yeah. it was a while ago. Yeah. yeah. And there's, there's a lot of kids at Mises U that want you to sign stuff. You know, what's weird is they'll ask you to sign human action and I'll always clarify. So, you know, I didn't write this, right? Okay. <laughs> that is funny. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So why don't, again, folks, Chris's book, the ethics of anarcho capitalism. First of all, what what made you decide there's a there's a niche there's another there's another book that needs to be written and I'm the guy Chris Bohr to do it. Uh, I guess I noticed a problem with libertarianism and I wanted to fix it. Um, actually, it was probably more desperate than that. You know, I was super obsessed with libertarianism. I mm. wanted to read everything I could. Um, and after going through everything, I I realized I didn't understand how libertarianism works, and I was pretty sure no one else did either. Uh, at least no one I could find. And to be fair. Most libertarians understand libertarianism implicitly. Um, the problem is no one can really define it precisely. So we would get into these situations where I'd be trying to answer a question. So when some uh, communist or something poses a question, well, how would libertarianism resolve this? And when I was applying the methods at the time, it would kind of lead to either self-contradictory or non-libertarian conclusions. And if that happened, you know, the person would not take libertarianism seriously. So there were endless arguments about 
what policies are libertarian, how does libertarianism work, what is the nature of it, what is it based on? Mm-hmm. So those are the questions that motivated me to actually write Okay, well, that that's fascinating to me. Do you remember, can you give an example, like a, someone who was not a libertarian challenging you and then you realize, like you started to, you is it that you actually in real time hit a dead dead end and you and you're like, oh shoot, I just lost the debate to this guy. Or you just met in your head, you went ahead six moves in the chess game and realized I can't go down this path doing what Murphy or Walter Block gave me because then I'm dead, you know, it's mating three moves. You, you yeah. get what I'm asking? Like, did yeah. you actually in practice realize, oh wait a minute, I didn't do a very good job in that online debate? Or is it just more you knew I can't say such and such because then that leaves me open to this counterattack. Uh, it was probably more the former at okay. first. But later on, um, yeah, I started reading libertarian papers, uh, which had a lot of interesting uh, discussion about you know, very specific ethical problems. Mm-hmm. And I remember reading a paper by Walter Block, and I thought, you know, the approach that was being taken um, you know, just really didn't work in general and could lead to problems. Well, in uh, fairness, he probably had a different co-author and wrote the opposite position six years later. Did. So, yeah. <laughs> That's Block for you. Uh, so I don't remember the specific problem that I came up with, but you know, there are certainly problems that still exist today that if you use the tools like the property system and the definition of the NAP that were around at mm-hmm. the time, you'll still run into the same problems. Okay, so can, can you, for, for the listeners who are like, what are you talking about, Chris? Our system's fine, and you know, just because you didn't know how to use it, don't blame us. Can you sure. think of a specific example? For of, sure. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the two main approaches that were taken at the time to define libertarianism were, I would say, Rothbard's non-aggression principle mm-hmm. and Hoppe's property rights. But they both had problems. So I'll just give examples for each. Okay, great. Uh, so for Rothbard's non-aggression principle, you know, the basic nap you could say is don't use force against others. That's not exactly what he said, but just to illustrate the point, um, if you use that rule, it works pretty well in a society that said don't you know, use force against others would take a libertarian stance on criminals who shoot or stab people, but it would take a non-libertarian stance on victims who use force to defend themselves, right? Because that's using force. So you can try to fix well, that. Def- I mean, okay. So I was, go- I was strictly speaking, and again, we won't get bogged down in this, but just to give the, because the, the, I do it for the listeners. They're yeah. going to say, we talk about, it's, it's the non-aggression principle. It's not the non-force principle. So yeah, you can't initiate aggression. So doesn't that easily dispose of what you just brought up? Yeah. So the problem is, how do you define aggression? So most people at the time would define aggression as either the use of force or the initiation of force mm-hmm. or as sort of property boundary crossing. So violating mm-hmm. somebody's space or something like that. So there are all these physical or physics-based definitions of aggression that end up having problems. Um, so where I was going with the the, um, the non-aggression principle definition is you can try to fix it by saying, well, don't initiate force. <clears throat> uh, but then there are non-force versions, uh, types of aggression like fraud. Right, you have to right. say initiate force or commit fraud. Yep. And then you, you keep adding things to this definition like neglect or whatever, but you never really truly hit on what you're trying to define, like what aggression really is. Um, and that's because... Uh, force is a physical concept, uh, but aggression is a behavioral concept. So physics is not really the right language to use when you're trying to de- define a behavioral concept. Um, and then for property rights, um, there's kind of this, uh, you know, four rules that define the property system. So there's owners get to decide how to use scarce resources. And then who is an owner? Well, you use self-ownership, you own your own body. Uh, use original appropriation. So if you're the first person to use something, you own it. And if somebody gives you something that's voluntary exchange, you get to own that too. So those are the rules. And if you follow the rules, again, it works pretty well. You get a mostly libertarian society. Uh, But unfortunately, you can run into situations where those rules don't quite work out also. Um, So I'll give one example. Great. For original appropriation, say uh, you're out in the wilderness in unowned land and you see a, some gold ore in a riverbed and you want to just go pick it up. If you go pick it up, you're the original appropriator and you should own it. And that makes sense. But, uh, you know, suppose someone like Tom Woods was about to pick up that gold ore and you, Bob Murphy, run over and push him out of the way and then grab it before he can. So you might have been the first person to grab the gold, the original appropriator, but libertarianism wouldn't really say you know, that you should be the owner, right? Because you committed some aggression to get that mm-hmm. gold. 
the rule doesn't really break down or it doesn't really work and breaks down when uh, aggression is mixed into the situation. And you can just like the nap, you can try to fix it by saying, well, you have to be the original appropriator without using aggression. But then the question is, how do you define aggression? Because the whole point of these property rules is to try to define libertarianism. So you get this sort of circular argument uh, where you end up not being able to fully define libertarianism uh, without some sort of pre-existing definition of aggression. Okay. Yeah. So uh, again, I don't want to get too bogged down on that because I want to get to your book, but it's, I could imagine you, you, you certainly had me this far on, on that last train of thought or that thought experiment where it's not obvious. So you say somebody is the first person and they're just about to go ahead and homestead something, you know, the un- unowned natural land. And then I come in and push the person out of the way. And then I'm the first one to technically homestead it. So clearly if we say, no, we, we were self owners before that moment. And so me pushing the person out of the way, that is an initiation of aggression. But then the issue is okay. But suppose that homesteaded or that virgin land hadn't been there. And I just want to push somebody and then, you know, what's the compensation? Oh, I got to, you know, give them a hundred dollars or something. Is that's what the libertarian judge would have ruled. But in the meantime, because I pushed him, I got all that virgin territory that I homesteaded that's, you know, ends up being worth a million dollars. Do I just still own the hundred? Because technically the crime I committed was pushing him over. So I, I could see how there, you get into some tricky stuff like that. Is that. And least- the judge, a judge can figure it out because a judge can look at the situation and say, you know, you actually did something bad. So we got to figure out how to make this right and try to pursue justice that way. But the problem is if you are trying to come up with the rules of libertarianism, you can't make the rules and kind of like fuzzy say, well, actually, we're going to just apply them as a rule of thumb. Mm-hmm. Are, you know, are there are there fundamental rules or a fundamental rule that really defines libertarianism and doesn't have exceptions, doesn't run into these corner cases where someone could say, well, in this situation, you have to abandon the rule and just use judgment. Mm-hmm. So some people try to get around that by saying, well, I'm going to use both the non-aggression principle and the property system. And when I run into problems with one, I'm going to jump to the other one. So if you catch me doing something funny with the nap, I'm going to jump over to property rights and say, well, I'll use property rights to fix it. Or if you catch me uh, trying to do something funny with property rights, I'll jump over to the nap. But even that doesn't work in the end. You can't just combine two like physical, physics-based definitions of libertarianism to try to fix the the problem. Now, is this... What, what, do you think that your uh, sensitivity to these kinds of tensions, at the very least, or contradictions, you might say, is be, is partly because of your background? Like when you go to program computers, you know, look, if you're just giving a computer a, a specific set of instructions, especially like if it's AI or something, and then it goes and does it, it can lead to some things that you did not intend. And like, are you seeing that with sort of blind following or adherence to the NAP if it's not spelled out like there's certain situations that we just all know, oh, wait, that that's not what we meant. Yeah, I think that could definitely be part of it. Also, you know, I, when I was getting into libertarianism, I was very into Austrian economics. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the great Austrian texts are based on praxeology and kind of written deductively from you know, some fundamental axioms. So I and many other people have thought, you know, is there a way to do that for ethics also? Is there a way to say, Here's the basis, and we can kind of derive all the other uh, implications for law and you know um, policies based on this original starting point. So it, it might have been my technical background, but mm-hmm. I'm not sure. Okay, l- last thing, and then I promise we'll d- dive into the book. Did is it that you think the whole enterprise of starting with axioms and then logically deducing things within this an ethical system is is the wrong approach, or you just think libertarians thus far hadn't done a good job of picking the axioms and and flushing that system out. Uh, I think libertarians had done a great job. They'd gotten pretty much all the way there. Um, And if you fast forward, you know, 40 years to like 2014, Kinsella and Tinsley put out a really great paper called causation and aggression, where they said, um, you know, the law is uh, about prohibiting aggression, you know, prohibiting aggressive action, non cons and they still were sort of hung up on physical definitions. So they said like non consensual violations of property boundaries. 
but they were talking more about this idea of behavior and praxeology as being the foundation for ethical uh, problems and legal structure rather than in trying to get away from this older idea of just physical stuff. Um, but I was, I was wondering, you know, are we in a situation where we've got a, a girdles and completeness theorem situation where libertarianism mm-hmm. just can't solve every problem or is it just that we haven't taken the right approach? Um, but my view, the conclusion I came to is that, um, applying the same tools, uh, that are not, not the same tools. So in, in economics, you use praxeology and you can kind of deduce a bunch of conclusions all of all of the economic laws, things that actually have to be, uh, in reality are, you know, derived from these praxeological starting points. Ethics is different. Ethics, you can't say because of praxeology, you must be libertarian. As far as I know, I know Hoppe mm. has done some work to try and prove that, but, uh, from my, from my perspective, I'm just trying to define what libertarianism, libertarian is, libertarianism is using praxeology because praxeology is the, the right tool set. It's the tool set for analyzing human behavior, human action. And that's all li- ethics really is. Like, how do you resolve conflict? How do you deal with people who are taking different actions and bumping into each other? So I think applying praxeology is the right approach. And that's what I did with the book. Okay. All right. Great. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and jump into this. So let me, <laughs> let me just folks, I'm, I want to read some of the, uh, the blurbs, you know, what folks, when you, you know, an author gets some, some big guns to give, to give blurbs for a book. Cause one of them is going to be funny. So Walter Block says, this is an excellent book on anarcho-capitalism. It covers all the bases and then some. This is an enjoyable read, an easy read, and at the end of the road lies real insight. Five stars. And then Stefan Kinsella says, this book uses praxeology to define libertarianism based on the non-aggression principle. ANCAPs may find the implications disconcerting or illuminating. And then the last one I'll read is Michael Malis says, I was dreading reading this, but it is conceptually excellent. <laughs> all right, and that's... And I, and I know what, I think I get what Malice is. I mean, he's obviously trying to be funny there, but um, because what this is, folks, it's like a Robinson Crusoe type narrative. So it's not just dry, like here are some principles, but it's all this is embedded in this story that it's it's you. So it's like, what is that? The second person, like the the, the author is writing the, or the narrator is writing, talking about you, the reader. So like you're, experiencing this so it's kind of keeping you interested because you you this is happening to you and then there's two other characters too it's big billy and annie end up joining you know it's on an island right yeah yes and so it's like i say folks it's like you know just as i'm sure many of the listeners know that there's like a robinson crusoe that's a popular technique to explain the principles of economics, like just for the isolated individual, you can do saving and investment like, oh, with your bare hand, you can harvest 10 coconuts a day. But then if you stop and, you know, go build a pole, then you can get 15 coconuts a day, but it's in the future, blah, 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 blah. You know, you can do all kinds of stuff, saving and investment and whatnot, capital accumulation. At the individual level, then you bring in another person, you start talking about interpersonal exchange and so forth. And so that's what you're doing here is you start just building up. And just to give people an idea, I'll I'll just say some of the chapter titles just so they they see. Sorry. So the chapter titles are Freedom, Capital, Liberty, Cooperation, Conflict. I'm jumping ahead. Lifeboat Scenarios, Capitalism, Anarchy, Purposeful Behavior. So that's the sort of thing. And so each chapter, again, it's going to talk about this a topic that's relevant to this philosophical and ethical framework. But again, the whole thing, it's this running story and it's, it surprisingly sucks you in. I think that's what Malice meant is that I think when he realized what it was, he was thinking, this is going to be awful. Sort of like someone says, Hey, I got this idea for, you know, a movie and it's going to do that. And you're like, Oh, you know, well, great. Some, some libertarian kid that's going to tell me about a movie, but it's actually a, a fun read. And then before we jump into what, you know, the chapter titles and whatever, I just want to point out to people, if you can see each chapter has a, a portrait of somebody, you know, a big gun from the movement. And so, Chris, how did you decide you were going to do that? And then w- w- did you hire someone to do that? Because some of those, like, caricature is not really the right word, I suppose. But it's not just like someone took a photo and 
and scanned it in. Yeah. Um, so how I decided to do the, uh, the portraits, uh, I just thought it'd be fun, right? I wanted the book to be, you know, as enjoyable as possible. And part of that, part of enjoying a book, I think, can be art. And uh, when I was looking for quotes to put in the beginning of chapters, I thought, well, wouldn't it be fun to actually see the people who are quoting, um, as you said, the big guns in the movement. Uh, so, yeah, I hired an artist online who did all the portraits for me, and I thought they turned out quite nice. Uh, I tried to find um, you know, younger photos of people um, yeah. because I'll, I'll look up David Friedman's while you're, you're explaining. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of these people were you know, older when I was writing the book or even uh, long gone. So I think it's, it's more fun to see people when they were younger and actually doing the, the work and writing that they were, uh, they were being quoted from. Uh, in terms of the narrative nonfiction, I, you know, I started thinking about how to convey the ideas. And when I originally started trying to explain these ideas to people, <laughs> yeah, disco David Friedman, as Malice likes to say, um, yeah, I tried doing like an academic approach where I just, you know, wrote papers and said, you know, here are the ideas and people are just like, eh, like that's fine, but I'm not, it's not that interesting. Um, and what people, I think what, re what resonated with people more are the examples when they see an example of how ethics, libertarianism can be used to resolve a, an ethical situation. So I started writing more and more examples about, um, you know, how to apply the principles of libertarianism. And I found that in order to really explain it well, you, you needed not just two people, but you needed three people. So I thought, okay, we need a, we need a scenario where we're talking about multiple people interacting. So I need additional characters kind of. And then I realized it'd be fun to kind of follow along with the same characters throughout the whole, the whole narrative. So that's where the narrative nonfiction came from. And like you said, Robinson Crusoe is a popular tool that's used in economics. So that mm -hmm. was a little inspirational as well. So I was borrowing from economics there. Okay, one last thing about the, uh, I don't know what, what term I want to use here, just, just the writing, the, the fictional aspect or the, the, the sort of approach, the method you use, the, the literary technique, that's the kind of phrase I wanted before we dive into the, you know, the actual meat here is, so you, it's a, a guy that talks about you as the, as the reader and then there's Annie and then there's Big Billy and so as the name suggests, Big Billy is the one who ends up in the beginning, you know, you're not sure how you feel about the guy and, you know, and he, he can be an aggressor, but Annie's tough. So it's not that you, the, like, like Annie's the one that keeps Big Billy checked. Right. And so I was going to ask you, Chris, did you ever read the Encyclopedia Brown stories? Do you know what that is? I think I might have when I was younger. Okay. Because there it was the same, it was a similar thing where, so there's Encyclopedia Brown, who, you know, is, is the real smart kid that knows everything. And he's the son yeah. of the police chief or something, at least a police officer. I don't remember if he's the chief. And then there was Bugs Meany, who is the bully that was often the, you know, the, the, the foil that, you know, Encyclopedia yeah. Brown would use his skills to, you know, uncover what did Bugs Meany do in that story or that, you know, chapter. But then I think his, I think her name was Sally, was Encyclopedia Brown's friend, but she was real tough and she could actually beat up Bugs Meany. And yeah, it didn't might, come off like a super feminist thing, but it was just a nice little, it was an interesting twist where it was the, the girl in the story who was like the protector, like who could provide the physical defense against, you know, physical aggression because obviously just because it's like a Pedia Brown knew something doesn't mean he can defeat the bully that way. That's interesting. I don't, I didn't explicitly copy that, but I may have subconsciously used that from okay. somewhere. Anyway, well, I, I noted. So, uh, and like I said, folks, it, it sounds like, oh my God, what is this? Some kind of feminine, it, it, do, it comes off fine. It doesn't seem like it's preachy or something. <laughs> and it just, for whatever reason, it makes it more interesting that the fact that you, you did it that way. Okay. So let me ask you this to give people an idea of how on the one hand you are, this is a very elementary book, let's say, like it's, you know, starting from first principles, and you're just trying to explain the, the, the system to, to a newcomer who has no previous uh, familiarity with these topics. But yet, and I think this is what, um, was it, was it Stefan? Right. And chaos may find the implications disconcerting or illuminating. I think this is probably what they're getting at is you take these things in certain ways that 
others have, have not. And so here, this isn't a huge one, but just to give you an idea. So right off the bat in page 12, you say, freedom can be limited by nature or it can be limited by other people. When you want more freedom from the constraints of nature, the solution is capital. If nature makes the night too cold, build a fire. When you want more freedom from the constraints imposed on you by other people, what you want is liberty. Liberty is the absence of conflict. It is a type of freedom and one that everyone could have today if people decided to stop committing crimes. Okay, so just even right there, like you had to decide specifically that even though a lot of times people use the words freedom and liberty interchangeably, you had to decide that, no, what I mean by free, you know, even concerns, you know, the, the, the limits imposed by nature, whereas liberty specifically refers to interpersonal conflict. So can you just talk a little bit about that, for example? And, um, you know, so on that specific one, did you come up with that or did you see other people using in that? And he said, you know what? Yeah, that, that more, those more specific thing. But the last thing here, because I could see some people, maybe even me saying, look, when we talk about freedom, like when I say a free society in a political, what I mean is, you know, where property rights are respected, obviously you can still die from cancer or something. It doesn't mean you're unfree. And it sounds like that's, that's not how you're using it. That you would say there is a sense in which your freedom is constrained if we don't have a cure for cancer, but you, you might still have full Liberty. Right. Yeah. And I think it's very important to have distinct concepts for freedom and Liberty, whatever you want to call them, but you need a way to say, um, you know, how, how do I talk about freedom in regards to interpersonal conflict versus freedom that you get from having wealth and capital and things like that? Um, and I think if you conflate the two, you run into a lot of problems when you're trying to build an ethical system. There are even there are some languages that don't have distinct words for freedom and liberty. So I think even just the, the linguistics there could make it very difficult for someone to understand libertarianism if you're trying to explain, well, libertarianism is about when two people are trying or in a fight or something. Um, but they only have one word for this broader idea of being able to do what you want and pursue, pursue the actions that you want to pursue. So I think if you want to take a praxeological approach to defining ethics and defining an ethical system, you really need those two distinct concepts uh, of freedom and liberty. Uh, whether I came up with, I don't think I came up, I don't think I came up with any of this stuff really. I've kind of just read everything everyone else was talking about and put it into a book together. So I don't, I don't know if there are any original ideas in the book, but sometimes when you organize something in a certain way, it can make it easier to understand. And that's was really my goal to, to just take libertarianism and polish it up a bit. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just running through, I guess, part of the problem. Then obviously I'm gonna give you a chance to respond here. My concern with the way you delineated it and I don't, ha I don't have a solution because I was thinking like, well, could we use for what you're calling freedom what if we call that power, for example, like, you know, your ability to achieve things that you want, regardless of whether, you know, the possible ethical implications, but that also runs, because we also use the word power sometimes in a very specific political, you know what I mean? Like someone might say, oh, you know, Bernie Sanders has way more power over you than Bill Gates does, at least before, you know, crony capitalism and whatnot. But that's, um, so that that's problematic too. But because I'm just thinking in terms of the way you're using the terms then, the free market is, is sort of a non sequitur. It's more like we would want to have the liberty market. Yeah, I think you're right. Many of these terms would be liberty based rather than freedom based. But since the words have been used interchangeably for so long, it doesn't matter so much. Or, yeah, we would have to change all that. And there may even be words that we haven't come up with yet that we should be using in the liberty movement to define some of these concepts, just like Rothbard was borrowing the idea of force for aggression, right? Mm -hmm. It's because we didn't really have this concept of aggression really fleshed out. But as the, as the definitions become more precise and our thinking becomes more clear, it, we can always coin new, new words to cover these things. Actually, I got a lot of pushback on the word capital, the way I was using the word capital. And you might appreciate this as an economist. I think um, many of the, fans of Austrian economics are like, no, that's not what capital is, right? Capital is not anything that you can use to, anything you value. Capital is like capital goods, so things that can be used to create consumer goods. So even there, there was some uh, overlap in, in the way terms are used. And you know, eventually there might be a different term for describing capital in the way I use it in the book, but we, I just didn't have a word for it yet. Okay, remind me, how are you using it in the book? 
So in the book, I use capital as just the term that it's anything that somebody values. So it could be, you know, a tool that you make or a stick that you find or even just, you know, an island that you live on. So it, anything that someone put, places value on, I say that's capital. So capital can really change based on, um, you know, the opinions and preferences of an individual actor. And typically people have the same idea of what capital is because people all want food and they all want shelter and things like that. But economists have a, I think, a more narrow definition of capital. They're not, they're not talking about anything that somebody might value. They're talking about specific capital goods that are part of the economy. Well, the, it's funny because I'm, I'm working on a, a chapter a, essay on the pure time preference theory right now. So I'm actually hip deep in all this stuff. It, it's tricky. So here I'm speaking as Bob Murphy, not as generic Austrian economist. In other words, I might say some stuff that not all Austrians would endorse. But yeah, I think there is, I would lean more towards what you're saying. In, in the, but I understand, like, so I imagine some of the pushback you got are people saying, no, I mean, an acre of farmland that's that's land or that's a natural resource that's not a capital good a capital good is a is a produced means of production blah 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 you know and and so your definition is too broad that's kind of what they're telling you right yeah so the problem with that is for one thing all right so let's say somebody has something like an acre of farmland well, what if somebody had improved it? You know what I mean? Like what if they, if they dug a, a ditch or something to help irrigate it or something or whatever? Um, then it, it, it turns into a capital good, right? Because it's not just the raw virgin natural resource. It has been transformed by human labor into something. And so then when, you, when you're talking about something, like do we need to keep track of the history of it? And like, what if we didn't, what if we forgot? Or we just, you know, we found something and we didn't know, you know, oh, this, this stick that's on the ground here, that is has a sharp point that we could use, you know, to easily kill gazelles with or something. Is that because some previous hunter grabbed a stick and sharpened it and we just happen to find it now? In which case, right. is it a capital good? Or is it there was, you know, a beaver did that, in which case it's pure virgin land. You know what I'm saying? Like it's it's weird that we would have to know the history of something in order to classify it economically when normally it's no, looking forward, our subjective intentions, and that's the definition. But also, too, forget all that stuff, just virgin land, fine, that no human's ever touched. And, you know, I I stick my flag in it, and so now I claim it, and I, I didn't push you out of the way to get it, so there's no doubt in the libertarian courts that I'm the owner of this. I homesteaded it. That still has a capitalized market value. Like, I could go, and now that I own that, legally speaking, and the courts recognize my title, I could go sell that for some gold, if gold is the money we're using. So it has a capitalized value. So whatever you want to call it, economic, you know, it, the, the value of that thing is capitalized. And so it, it is corresponds to a certain amount of financial capital at the very least. So I think that's part of the problem is the distinction between capital goods and then financial capital. And that's some of the problem and how, how economics gets into trouble. Yeah. So this might be another area where we just need new words to describe the different types of capital that we're talking about. And in ethics or in ethics, in the ethics world, you don't need to worry about things like the production process or the change of goods over time, right? You're more concerned with you know, the actions of individuals and uh, what they're valuing, what they're trying to do. So the broader definition of capital works well for what I'm trying to do, but I can see why economists would say, no, no, that doesn't work for us. Okay. So let me read something here to give people a flavor of how the book proceeds. So again, you're, you're getting into some, your goal is to teach people the principles of anarcho-capitalism and like the ethical foundations of it. Is that true? You agree with that? Yep. And, and again, but you're not just doing it with dry sort of a textbooky discussion. It's embedded in this story. And like I say, it's not that the story, re it's not like you're watching Star Trek and every, every episode starts again from the beginning. And then it's just a new story. It's like, it's a running narrative. Like, so it's, you know, things have happened by chapter 15 that if you didn't read the previous chapters, you know, you you would have missed some. It's like, if you're watching a, a mini, a mini series as opposed to some like recurring show. Okay. Exactly. And so to give people a flavor of that. So you're on this, this tropical Island. So is Annie. And then you're and here. Chris is talking about this, the chapter on praxeology. So I'll, it, it's just be, it'll be like eight sentences or so folks just to get to pace yourself. So praxeology involves thinking about human behavior in a way that incorporates both what people do and their objective for doing it 
When you consider a person's physical behavior and mental state as a single unit, it makes it much easier to reason about certain things like ethics and economics. Economists call this combination human action or just action for short. You can discuss situations by referring to the actions involved. Da, 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 da. When Annie lays out on the beach to sunbathe, her goal is to enjoy the sun's rays. If you stand between her and the sun, you, you would cast a shadow and interfere with what she is doing. If she were laying on the beach only to rest, she might not care about a shadow or might even prefer the shade. To know which situation you are in, you need to infer what is going on in her mind. Since Annie has many routines, it is often apparent what her intentions are without asking her. But deciphering the human action of others is not always so straightforward. And then, so actually I want to talk about this next one. So now he's, folks, he's going to like apply this to a more specific situation. Just yesterday, Annie took some dried coconut and tossed it into the woods. You never saw her do that before, so you wondered if it would be okay for you to go and help yourself to it. If she was disposing of it because she didn't want it anymore, then that would be just fine. If she was putting fruit in the woods to try to attract crabs or birds to hunt, then taking the fruit would interfere with what she is doing and lead to conflict. These are two different actions with the same physical behavior, but different mental components. Okay. And so again, again so the, that's, I think that's a good, you know, illustration for people or, or demonstration of what Chris is doing in the book where he's, he's getting at an important deep point of it's not enough just to observe the physical motions of people's bodies. That's not enough for you to conclude like, Hey, is there conflict here? Did this person, you know, whether it violates property rights or not, but did this person do something that would upset the other person? Let's not, let's remain agnostic as to whether it's aggression um, or, you know, unethical. It's not enough just for the physical facts of the situation. You need to know what were the subjective intentions of the person. And just to give a, a another example of this recently, I tweeted about this, Chris, where I, we have an 18 month old and so, you know, he's running around the house and everything. And I, and he, and it just so happened at one point where I was running ahead of him and he was coming after me. He was trailing me and squealing. And my wife said, oh, is he chasing you? Because he hadn't clearly done that before. Like normally we might chase him around and he would run away and think it was hilarious or whatever. But in this case, like I said, I was in front and he was following after me squealing, you know, laughing and whatever and being jokey. And so she said, is he chasing you? And my honest answer was, I'm not sure. So right. for sure... I was walking and he was running after me with his arms, but it could have been just a coincidence that he wanted to go where I was going to. And I was just ahead of him. It wasn't, I wasn't certain whether, and so to answer the question, is he chasing me? It's not enough just to know, is his body trailing me? It, you know, you need to know what is his intention? What's his goal? Just like if you're driving folks and you make three turns and the car behind you matches your turns and you're like looking and you say to your passenger, I think this guy's following me. <laughs> it, what you mean by that is not, he happens to still be within a hundred yards of me. That's not what you mean. Cause yes, right. clearly he is following you in that sense. But what you mean when you say, I think this guy's following me is, well, people know what that means, but notice you have to get inside the person's head. So, or actually to be more precise, you have to get inside the person's mind because you couldn't just look in their head. It's not a matter of, you know, what their, where the cells are and what their arrangement is. Like it's really, it's more you know, a subjective, intangible thing. Okay, exactly. so I just spoke for a long time. Chris, what, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> I think that really gets to the heart of it, right? Um, you can't solve, just like you can't really do a good job as an economist by treating people as physical objects, balls bouncing around and using physics. You can't do a good job as a judge or an ethicist by just trying to observe the physical behavior of people. Um, so that's why the idea of you know force as aggression doesn't work. That's why the idea of defining property rights as just physical boundaries and trying to make that the basis of libertarian ethics won't work. Um, you really have to take that next step, like the guy driving the car and say, you know, what are, what are the people in this situation thinking? What are they trying to do? And that's how you determine whether there's conflict or not. Yeah, so here's another one too, an example of ambiguity and how it's difficult to render a decision on these ethical issues. So it's another vignette, folks. Annie and Big Billy are fighting. You established that this is a real conflict. Now you need to know who caused the conflict. How did this all start, you ask? Billy responds immediately. I saw her take that coconut from my stash. That's true, but I only took the coconut because it was originally one of mine. He stole it from me, Annie says. 
I did not, Big Billy says, I found it on the ground. Where, you ask? Near Annie's pile. How close, you ask? About this far away, he says, holding his hands about a meter apart. Annie butts in, and it didn't occur to you that maybe it fell off my pile? No, it was pretty far away, he says with a straight face. After all that, you think you understand what happened. Now you need to make a judgment. Did Annie cause it when she took the coconut from Big Billy's pile, or was it Big Billy's fault for taking the coconut from near Annie's stack? Are they both responsible to some extent? Okay, and so, again, you, you know, it's a sort of simplistic scenario, but you're just trying to illustrate, even if we stipulate the basic facts that, you know, Annie f- agrees that, oh, yeah, that the coconut that I just took was previously in his pile and I just took it. That's not enough to label her as a criminal or as a thief because it matters. Was that originally hers? But even there, it's not a simple matter because what if, like you say, she had it in her pile and the wind blew it and it, and it rolled off a little bit and it was, uh, you know, it, it matters how far away was it. At the very least, to know whether Billy, um, you know, she, she, you, well, you tell me, Chris, how does that work? Is it, yeah. is he still, could you be a thief and not know it? Or it would it be something else like you, in other words, you accidentally took someone else's property. Yeah. You got to give it back, but That's you're not a criminal like because you honestly problems. didn't know. Yeah. It can go quite deep, um, and that's that's why um, you really need to use judgment when you're looking at ethical problems, because even in the scenario you just laid out, say uh, say Annie put the coconut you know a little bit away from her pile to induce Big Billy to take it, and you know, maybe then she's the aggressor, mm-hmm. but maybe maybe Big Billy saw her do that, so he knew that she was doing it, so taking it was a an aggression aggressive action anyway, so. Uh, ethical problems um, are kind of interesting because any little fact can change the conclusion. So that's why it's so important to really understand the total situation, all the action that's going into it. Um, and that's also why you can have sort of uh, interesting courtroom drama scenarios where it looks like someone's guilty, someone's guilty, and then one fact comes up and that mm-hmm. totally change, flips the case, right? But it's true for any ethical problem. You can You can dig a little deeper and find something that makes you realize that the actions are not what you were, what you thought they were as an outside observer. Yeah. So for example here, folks, um, just to show what Chris is talking about. So you may have in your own minds at home have spelled out some of the implications. Like, no, I I could easily handle situations like this. I don't know why Bob and Chris are getting all bent out of shape, but check out this one, folks. Um, For example, whenever Annie picks a coconut, she writes her first initial on it. Yesterday, Big Billy thought it would be funny to secretly write Annie's first initial on one of your coconuts. Then this morning, Annie saw that coconut, assumed it was hers, and took it. There is a conflict, but it is not theft. That is, the person responsible is Big Billy, not Annie. He is the one that caused the conflict by misleading Annie. In this way, you have identified a kind of crime, coconut ownership falsification. There is already a shorter name for this type of aggression, fraud. You can use the same approach to examine every kind of crime from first principles. Okay, so in, in case I went too fast in that, so people are saying, um, you know, you, the the reader of this book, you, it's your clearly your coconut. You have it, you put it in your pile, and then Annie ends up taking it from you in the morning. So it looks like she's a thief. You know, she initiated aggression, that's theft. But wait a minute, what if what actually happened is Annie habitually writes an A, on all the coconuts she harvests to show this is mine. And what if in the middle of the night, Billy snuck over to your pile and wrote an A on one of your coconuts that was on the top and then snuck away, you know, without anyone seeing it. And so in the morning, Annie sees that and assumes, what the heck? You, the reader of this book, stole my coconut last night for some reason. I'm going to take mine back. So she clearly would have thought. And so there it's, yes, we can conclude Billy initiated aggression perhaps if, if in, the, in the Rothbardian framework, but he's not really a thief. He didn't take the coconut. All he did was cause mischief. And so, yeah, he violated a property. He wrote an A without your permission on your property, but it's not that he stole the coconut per se. And so it's a, it's an interesting thing. And I guess your point, Chris, is in any real world situation, stuff like that's going to come up. And so you got to be really careful before you just make these blanket principles. Yeah. That you and this think- problem can arise without any sort of property boundary crossing. If say Big Billy just told Annie that one of the coconuts was hers and she went and took it, 
because she believed him. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe Big Billy never did anything that physically looked like aggression in the old paradigm of property rights and non-aggression principle. Um, but clearly that is a non-libertarian outcome. So mm-hmm. that just sort of illustrates why it's so important to take a praxeological approach when you want to think deeply about ethical problems. Right, or even there too, like to even make it more concrete for the listener who's resisting uh, what if Billy tells you, or sorry, tells Annie, oh yeah, that guy, he told me you had his permission to take mm-hmm. one of those. So there, you would clearly think the, the title had been transferred or whatever, but again, it's your knowledge of the situation would have been caused by, you know, and I suppose even there too, it makes a difference. What if Billy actually believes what he's telling you and he's just mistaken? Then that complicate you know what I mean that that's different from if Billy is purposely just messing with you and trying to get you to take or try to get Annie to steal a coconut. Yeah. And these are all things that a libertarian would think about when they're trying to apply the property system or the old non-aggression principle, the forest based principle. But they would be doing it outside of the rural framework. They'd be saying, okay, here's the framework, but I'm gonna have to think about all these other things. And I think it's a more productive approach uh, to make that explicit, right? We're explicitly saying libertarianism includes this idea of what people are thinking and what they're doing in a praxeological de- definition of the non-aggression principle. And then you have to solve problems using that non-aggression principle. And it's more complicated because you've got to think about both mental and physical components of everybody, but it will get you to a, a more libertarian conclusion at the end of the day. Okay. Uh, let me, where is, do you remember what the title of the chapter is that has my headshot on it? It's fine <laughs> if you don't. <laughs> Am- ambiguity, I think. Yeah, how appropriate. Page uh, 119. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. Oops. And I, while you're looking for that, I should mention just your listeners that it's not that the property system is bad or the old non-aggression principle is bad. They're, they're very, very good and they have their uses. Um, they're just different. They're not the foundation for libertarianism. The property system is a tool that you can use to get very close to libertarianism without always having to use the praxeological map and do like a deep investigation of every situation. It's much easier to say, you know, who owns this house? Then I should ask them if they would let me stay there rather than saying, you know, who are all the people involved? What are they thinking? What are they doing with the house? Um, for most day-to-day interactions, it's much easier to say, who is the owner? And let me just get their permission to do things. So it's a way of approximating libertarianism with much, much less work. So in a libertarian society, you would still have a property system with property rights and you would use that. Everyone would use that day-to-day. It's just that the law and judges and people who are thinking deeply about ethical problems or people who are investigating really complicated crimes would be able to fall back on the praxeological map to do that deeper investigation where property rights really can't figure it out. All right. So if anyone cares, I don't know how I feel about that. I think just like a lot of people like don't like hearing their own voice. Uh, we can change the photo if you like. I just, it was the best one I could find online. <laughs> no, I like it. Um, Okay, so the quote you've got for me here is, finally, keep in mind that the ultimate judge in a given case is the judge. No matter how voluminous the law books or how obvious the precedents, every case will ultimately depend on the subjective interpretation of an arbiter or judge who must deliver the ruling. We must never forget that written statutes as such are powerless unless used by competent and equitable individuals. Only in a competitive voluntary system is there any hope for judicial excellence. Um, and so what? I guess what I want to... So here, here's kind of, that, that was from chaos theory, I'm pretty sure. Um, wh- where I had come with that stuff, and so Chris, I want to see if you think this is right or you think it's wrong, is I had, you know, I had hit some of the, the issues you're talking about and I realized like sort of armchair libertarianism where, you know, I, I was afraid about th- libertarians thinking they could centrally plan the legal system. And that, oh yeah, we can just sit back and from first principles deduce everything and, and I thought, well, no, there's lots of situations that, you know, in the same way that you, you know, decentralized spontaneous order in the marketplace where you got people on the ground and entrepreneurs in Akron who see the situation there and people, uh, you know, in diamond mines in South Africa and whatever. And so there's all this information dispersed all over the planet. And that's one of the reasons the central planning doesn't work, the one that Hayek stressed more than Mises. 
Um, likewise, I thought it's a mistake to sit there and try to just centrally plan libertarianism in the judicial framework and think that we can come up with, oh, in a free society, here's what all the property titles would look like. I thought that was a mistake, just like you wouldn't say in a free society, this is how many gas stations there would be. You'd say, well, no, we could give a framework, but that's something that, you know, the specifics would have to spit out. But on the other hand, you wouldn't just want it to be anything goes to say, oh yeah, everything is libertarianism because oh, this is the way society evolved and that must have been in the best interest of everyone that everyone's maximizing utility because why would they do something that makes them less happy? Therefore, everything is, is libertarianism. Yay. Like that also doesn't work. And so I was sort of thinking that, yeah, like judges would advertise, you know, th these are the, this is the framework that I'm going to use when applying cases or when, when judging cases. And in a free society, people who are having a conflict, the demand for judge judicial services wouldn't be because, oh, there's a Supreme Court and this state system that has a bunch of guys with guns and cages that force you to go see a judge who has jurisdiction on this matter. Rather, there's conflict and then people can't resolve it themselves. And so they want to go to a third party who the community recognizes as, you know, having authority in some sense on this issue to, to kind of get back up to say, look, it's not just me saying this, this judge who's an expert in wage dispute, you know, employee disputes says that this, this employer owes me back wages for this, you know, and, and this guy says it too. So there again, it's the judges, you know, there would be precedents and there could be big cases that overturn previous ones and so on. But the judges would want some predictability because to, to the plaintiff and the defendant are only going to go to a judge and submit to the ruling if they think that the judge has a decent framework, right? So if you were getting divorced and you go to an arbitration, you're not going to go to some arbiter who always rules in favor of the wife. Like the husband wouldn't agree to that. And so anyway, so that, that's kind of like interplay where, yeah, there's, there's basic principles, but they need to be applied in certain situations. And sometimes the principles are going to conflict. And that's where the judge is needed is to say, in this case, this principle trumps that principle. And that's why we're going to rule this way. And maybe other judges would disagree. Are you okay with all that? Or am I missing something in yours? No, that sounds right. You know, when you create a, you know, an ethical rule like the non-aggression principle, you want it to be very general so that it's not going to, it's going to be self-consistent. But since when it's super general, it can't tell you the answer to specific questions. And that's where the judge comes in. They apply the principle and then they would have those frameworks that you were talking about where, you know, I've, I've applied the non-aggression principle to these kinds of cases. Here's generally how it plays out. But at the end of the day, the judge has to look and say, you know, does my secondary principle, my rule of thumb apply to this case, or do I need to do something a little more specific using uh, the praxeological nap to get the right libertarian conclusion here? Okay. Um, so why don't we then st step back? And so how do you, what do you think about the present situation? So you, when did you write this book? I guess it was a year and a half ago, something like that. I'm trying to see what the actual, you've got, okay. So first published March 2nd, 2020. Okay. So this, you had just wrapped this up right before all the COVID stuff hit. Yep. Did, has that changed your, like your, your view of, ah, you know, libertarianism, Austrian economics is chugging along. And now we're going to have another tool in our arsenal here, this book that I've written to help get the message out and whatever. And then, COVID hits and you've seen the reaction to that. Have, have you, has that changed your perspective on anything? Um, no, I think uh, COVID shook up a lot of things, but not my faith in Austrian economics or libertarianism. Um, I think it's just another example of why we need to evolve our society more towards an anarcho-capitalist society, because you can kind of see the destructive power that governments have when they can violate the non-aggression principle and just create arbitrary rules and, if that favors some people at the expense of others, you know, how many people have died because of government policies that have been just laying over entire states or the entire country? Um, you know, certainly there are benefits, but uh, <laughs> there are many unforeseen costs and hidden costs to all these uh, policies that are put in place. So, um, yeah, I don't think a lot has changed for me from a principal perspective in terms of my optimism. Um, it certainly makes me nervous when there are big shifts in uh, how society is working and, uh, especially shifts that are in sort of a, a dangerous direction. Um, but I, I'm ultimately optimistic that, you know, all the different people who are working towards libertarian goals are going to be successful. Like, uh, you know, my book maybe helps a little bit, but I think 
things like your podcast help even more, just promoting it, getting more people on board with the ideas of libertarianism. Because at the end of the day, it's really public opinion that determines the way society is going to go. You know, politicians are just kind of following what most people in the electorate want them to do. And so as we get more and more libertarians on board, I think, think the society will follow. Um, so, yeah, I'm optimistic in the long run. Okay, great. Um, so, folks, the book is The Ethics of Anarcho-Capitalism. I'll obviously put links. You go to bobmurphyshow.com slash 222 to uh, find the links to this and some of the other stuff that, that we've been talking about. My guest has been Chris Bohr. Chris, thanks so much for your time. It's been great. Thank you very much. You've just experienced another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. For more information and to subscribe to this podcast, visit bobmurphyshow.com.